Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Karen Huber, and I'm with Home Instead here in Cedar Rapids. And I'd like to welcome all of you to the Caregiv Caregiver Wellness Day. Uh, I've been a member of this Caregiver Wellness Day committee for, oh, on, on the planning committee for probably at least 13 years now. And let me just say this, this year has been a, a fun and exciting year because we get to do things different. And, and I always say, when you can adjust to the change in life, you're having a good time. Uh, so this year has definitely been a change, uh, just like last year when we're not able to do our live meeting in November, we're doing the webinar series instead. And so we've broken it into five series and uh, coming to you through the webinar uh, program instead, we're doing it virtually. Uh, the virtual series will run through November. Uh, so uh, you'll see us again uh, next month in October and then one last time in November. In previous years, like I said, we've hosted it in person and we're able to give you valuable information uh, and meet one-on-one -on -one with uh, the different uh, businesses in town that are here to help you. So if, if you don't get your question asked, answered today, please reach out to us and, and let us know. Let, we wanna let you know we're here to help you through uh, any planning that you're doing right now with helping a loved one. Uh, but today we've got some great information uh, just for you. So Barb, I'm gonna go ahead and let you take it from there. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And as Karen said, it's just really great to see everyone here uh, again for another month of uh, this series. Um, I'm Barb Warning. I'm the Executive Director at Heritage Area Agency on Aging. And we have been involved in this event for 20 years. And it's been just a really great experience being able to support all the caregivers in our area. It truly, this event can't be possible without all of you out there taking care of your loved ones. We really um, do appreciate appreciate what you do. Also, this event has flourished because of our sponsors. Today's sponsor is The Views, and we would like you to know that all dollars from our sponsors are deposited into the Heritage Family Caregiver Fund to help pay for the needs and services to help caregivers continue to provide care for their loved ones. Um, so we're going to get started very soon. Again, thanks so much for joining in this unique way, but great way of getting information out to you during these um, unique times. We're going to start with a commercial uh, from The Views. If you're considering senior living for yourself or family members, it can be easy to feel overwhelmed with options. We understand that enhancing the quality of where you live impacts how you live. The Views of Marion offers a welcoming community of choices that range from independent and assisted living to long-term care and rehabilitation services. Our one-of-a-kind memory care center is designed to help you socialize and make friends in a space that feels like home. To find out more about life at The Views of Marion, call Michelle to schedule a personal tour. With staff longevity of 10 plus years, the views of Cedar Rapids offer dedication and commitment to our residents living with dementia. At Memory Care Village Center, our residents enjoy enhanced socialization through our unique daily activity schedule. Ridgeview Assisted Living helps older adults maintain their privacy, independence, and well-being in a safe and fun-filled environment. I've lived here for three and a half years now. It wasn't long, and this was my home. Call Jonathan today and schedule your personal tour. So, oh, thank you again to The Views for everything they do for our community. Uh, I'm going to be introducing our speakers for today's event. Nicole Karras is from Lynn County Veterans Affairs and Jennifer Smentek is from the Veterans Affairs Family Caregiver Program. Both of our speakers today are going to discuss how caregivers can navigate the VA system to access programs to help them with their caregiver journey. Before we get started though, I wanna remind everyone that's listening today that we are going to have time for questions after both of the presentations. If you're on Zoom, you can type your question into the chat box at the bottom of the screen. If you're on Facebook Live, you can just go ahead and enter your question into the Facebook box or Facebook area also and we'll go ahead and take those questions um, after our presentations are done. The first first up is Nicole's presentation. Nicole recently retired from the United States Air Force Reserve with over 20 years of honorable military service. She has deployed multiple times in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. She completed various leadership courses and has a bachelor's degree in science 
in applied management. Nicole Karras worked as an accredited veteran service officer for more than 10 years in the state of Ohio before becoming the Veterans Affairs Director for Lynn County. Now, unfortunately, Nicole is not able to be here today, but she's graciously provided her presentation for us. And we've asked Kelly Elliott Capros to step in and provide the presentation in the PowerPoint to us. Uh, but these are Nicole's, uh, this is Nicole's information and we do wanna thank Nicole as well. Thank you, Kelly, and I'll turn it over to you. No problem here. I will share my screen. Again, this is Nicole's presentation. Um, oh, hold on one second. I'm so sorry. I practiced this, but now I can't seem to get it right. Okay. Ah, here. And I want to do slideshow. My apologies. My apologies here. So again, I'm Kelly Elliott Capros from the Heritage Area Agency on Aging, and I'm very happy to share Nicole's uh, slides today because she is unable to be here. Um, we do have experts that are going to be joining us on the call and have joined us on the call and they will be able to help you guys with um, any questions that I cannot answer. So um, Nicole uh, has provided information on the VA pension programs and the aid and attendance benefits, which I know are very important to um, many veterans and caregivers of veterans. So with that said, here's um, some, some first starts to some, um, some uh, definitions here. So uh, pension, the pension is the needs-based benefit to help uh, a wartime veteran or a surviving spouse or su surviving child of a wartime veteran. Qualify, qualifications for an improved pension, it's an entitlement to the VA pension benefits, and it's based on the veteran's character of discharge. In addition to that, there is a wartime service requirement, a minimum active duty service requirement, and meeting the income and net worth requirements on that, okay? Uh, the, the qualifications for the improved pension are at least one day of active service during the period of war, and 90 days or more of active military service. And it has to be effective um, September 7th, 1980 and must serve at least 24 months of continuous service or an entire period called to active duty. Um, it, it is um, eligible for everybody except for anyone with a dishonorable discharge. So other qualifications, you must be 65 or older or permanent and totally disabled prior to age 65 or in receipt of social security disability or in some places you'll see it called SSD or requiring in-home care, assisted living or nursing home care. There are other veterans pensions that may be awarded to a veteran retroactively for up to one year prior to the date of the receipt of the claim if any of the following criteria apply age 65, found disabled by Social Security Administration for the purpose of Social Security Disability Benefits, or a patient in a nursing home for long-term care because of the disability. And this one does not uh, apply to the survivor's pension. Qualifications for the survivor improved pension for the spouse. Um, it, you would be a surviving spouse of a wartime veteran with a qualifying service. The surviving spouse, the general requirements for that is you were the spouse at the time of the veteran's death. You lived with the veteran continuously from the date of the marriage to the date of the veteran's death. Also married at least one year prior to the veteran's passing away or a child was born as a result of the relationship and cannot be remarried. Um, so a surviving spouse's benefits can be reinstated if his or her remarriage terminates prior to November 1, 1990. So it's very um, individual specific. And then of course there's the income and net worth guidelines as well. 
Qualifications for a survivor improved pension for a child. Child requirements are uh, obviously a surviving child of a wartime veteran, and the child is unmarried, under the age of 18, or 18 to 23 and enrolled in school as a full-time student or seriously disabled before the age of 18. Again, there, there are income and net worth guidelines on that as well. So qualifications for special monthly pension need to be housebound, have a single permanent disability and substantially confined to the home because of that disability. Aid in attendance is a beneficiary, the beneficiary is blind or nearly blind or so, um, so in need to require the aid of another person to perform their personal functions for everyday, leave, li everyday living and or a patient in a licensed nursing home receiving care. Uh, additional qualifications, they have to have the medical evidence okay, to prove the disability. And then there's a form that needs to be completed um, and it must be signed by a healthcare professional. The net worth concepts, bright line net worth limit. Um, uh, I'm gonna summarize this a little bit because it does get to specific dollars, but essentially less than 130,000 as of October 18th, 2019, 130,000 as of December 1, 2020. And the limits are increased each year by the same percentage of the social security cost of living uh, adjustment. Uh, residential lot size limits, Residential lot area is the lot in which residence sits that it does not exceed two mm -hmm. acres unless the additional acreage is not market, market, marketable. Um, and then there is a look back period too. So they will look back 36 months um, from the date of the claim. Um, it starts from the date of the claim, not a date to intend to file. And it does not um, include transfers prior to October of 2018. And there is a, yeah, a, a formula to calculate income for the VA purposes, okay? Um, one thing to note from this slide is it does uh, factor in medical expenses that individuals may have, which is very important to, to many people in this situation. Countable income, uh, general rule is that all income is countable um, unless specifically excluded. So common countable income is gross earnings, social security, disability benefits, retirement income, uh, interest and dividends from any investments, unemployment compensation, uh, business or rental income, um, any withdrawals from uh, IRAs or indi indi individual retirement accounts and any gambling winnings. So for those of you that are lucky out there, more lucky than me, your gambling winnings would uh, be counted as income. Uh, income exclusions. So some of the things that are commonly excluded is your VA pension, your profit from the sale of a primary residence, so your actual home, welfare or supplemental security income, excuse me, <clears throat> income tax refunds, uh, and conversion of assets. So removing money from a bank account and a CD or cashed in life insurance for the death of the venture, veteran. And there are potentially mineral royalties, um, which obviously depends on land ownership that can be um, excluded on that. Um, when they are counting the medical expense deductions, um, again, was that you know, important thing that we had talked about, um, it is permitted if all of the following conditions exist. So you have to have all of these for the medical expense deductions. The expenses are actually paid for by the beneficiary or the beneficiary spouse, and the expenses are not, are, they're not reimbursed by another source, so unreimbursed. Expenses are for the beneficiary or relative who is a constructive member of the household, and expenses exceed the 5% medical deductible. Some examples of medical expenses our Medicare Part D and Part B and D premiums, private medical insurance, ongoing prescriptions, non-prescription drugs or over-the-counter drugs, 
medical supplies, you know, food supplements, that type of deal. It is limited to 1500 per household member per year. Medical supplies also include incontinence supplies. So you'd wanna track those expenses. Uh, care facilities or in-home care providers for beneficiaries are entitled to aid in attendance or household, housebound benefits. This is one of the forms that you would complete to itemize those medical expenses. And I know you can get these through the VA, but this is a glimpse of what it looks like, okay? Um, counting care facility expenses, it needs to be a nursing home. And they've um, referenced the form here for that. So you would count all the facility and medical service fees um, and, and claim from there. Deductible medical expenses, again, regulation defines that it has to be related to activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living and custodial care. And these are the, the definitions of, of those um, medical expenses, uh, activities of daily living and, and the others here. So um, ADLs or activities of daily living, those are the basic self-care activities showering, bathing, dressing, toileting, uh, instrumental activities of daily living. These are more independent living activities such as shopping, food preparation, running errands, paying your bills, that type of thing. And custodial care is defined, defined as regular assistance with two or more ADLs or supervision because the individual needs that care and assistance on a regular basis to protect themselves. So counting care, care facility expenses, other types of facilities, not just nursing homes, assisted living, independent, senior living, residential care, group homes, etc. They count the room and board if the, if the facility provides health care or custodial care. So if the facility doesn't do that, you wouldn't count it. Um, again, custodial care includes providing assistance with two or more activities of daily living and supervision uh, due to physical, mental, development, or cognitive, cognitive disorder. And again, the facility must be licensed by the state and staffed 24 hours a day. Counting in-home care fees, payments must be um, matching with the number of hours that the provider attends to the person. Um, receipts and other document of payment of this have to be shown and you have to make sure that the receipt or the documentation includes the amount paid, date payment was made, purpose of the payment, name of the person the services were provided for, so who was the care recipient, and the actual provider. Uh, the Medicaid $90 rate, um, this VA must limit claims to $90 a month for a veteran surviving, surviving spouse or surviving child who has neither spouse nor dependent child and is a Medicaid approved nursing facility and a Medicaid plan covers in part or all of his or her nursing home care. Um, important to note, <coughs> excuse me. You always get the throat tickles when you're given a presentation, don't you? It's just the rules. <laughs> no overpayment is created when reducing to the $90 rate. The 90-day payment is for personal use and not, cannot be used to cover nursing home expenses. And then the exception is that it's not reduced to the $90 rate if it's the state veterans home. This here is the contact information for where you can reach Nicole to get much more information for Lynn County. Um, I'm sure there will be other information as well shown. So if you're not Lynn County specific and you're somewhere else, there are um, Veterans Affairs offices all around our state. Um, so this is specific to Lynn County um, information there. And that is all I have for you today. And I will stop sharing my screen. And I just wanna thank you all very much for your time. It was a pleasure to be able to present Nicole's information.
Well, thank you so much, Kelly, uh, for stepping in for Nicole. I know Nicole really wanted to be here today and was just unexpectedly um, uh, unexpectedly able to be here. So she, Kelly, thanks for stepping in. And uh, we're gonna move on now to Jennifer's presentation. Um, Jennifer is currently the Acting Social Work Executive and Caregiver Support Program Manager for the Iowa City VA Healthcare System. She's been with the VA since 2008, and she's had several social work roles, including case manager, packed social worker, and supervisor of the Iowa City VA Healthcare for Homeless Veterans Program. She has over 22 years of experience as a professional social worker, and before joining the VA, she practiced in mental health, substance abuse, and dialysis. Jennifer earned her MSW from the University of Iowa, and she has a BA from Cornell College. And welcome, Jennifer. Great to see you. And I'm going to turn it over, over to you if you're ready to go. Thank you. Um, I will hopefully start sharing my screen here in just a minute. Sure. Um, I am going to also recognize, whoops, because I see it, it shows it shows Jennifer Smentek on the, the screen twice, so people see People are seeing the, the folks here. Um, I'm going to recognize um, James Johnson, uh, who's also with the Caregiver Support Program, because um, I just sent him my link. Um, he's with the Caregiver Support Program and is actually our general caregiver support coordinator. Um, he, was, he was on camera a moment ago, but he is the block that says Jennifer. There he is. Um, that's actually James Johnson, not, not Jennifer Sontag. Uh, we don't look alike at all. Um, so he's here with us as well uh, and may be available to answer some uh, some questions as well. I'm trying to share my screen. It says hosts a uh, disabled participant screen. Um, We're going to get that taken care of for you, Jennifer. Okay. okay. Are you able to see that? You see my presentation. All right. Um, so of course we are talking about our caregiver support program today. And so our mission is uh, to promote the health and well-being of family caregivers, who of course are caring for our nation's veterans. Um, and we do this through education resources, support, and service. Uh, that is our mission. We have four pillars that help us with that mission. And that is inclusive care, education and training, uh, trusted partnerships, and of course, uh, Heritage Area Agency and Aging would be one of our partnerships. Uh, service excellence is our last pillar. And we're gonna go through uh, those support pillars just a little bit here in today's presentation. Inclusive care, what does that actually mean? Um, empowerment, collaboration and coordination. So with empowerment, we look at promoting uh, a strengths-based approach to foster a caregiver's knowledge and confidence, really confidence in their own uh, abilities, their own capabilities in caring uh, for their veterans. Uh, we're also looking at collaboration. We wanna increase communication and participation between caregivers and our own VHA providers, the primary care team, their specialists, um, anyone that that caregiver is interacting with at VHA. Uh, we're also looking at coordinating and facilitating access to services and benefits for caregivers and the veterans that they support. Um, so I'm breaking for just a second. You bet. I don't know if anybody else is, has this issue, but. It doesn't look like you're, at least on my computer, the slides aren't advancing. Uh -huh. I just wanted to make sure that we're actually seeing the presentation because this is a good presentation. So <laughs> I just want to make sure everybody can see it. There we go. How about that? Yep. All right. Now, now, now we're, now we're clicking. Ta-da. Okay because I'm sharing a different screen. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. This is why I included you today. Um, okay. Uh, education and training. 
includes uh, development and both outreach. We're providing training and support to our caregivers. Again, we're looking at enhancing their confidence, uh, their abilities to care for both themselves and their veterans. Uh, our program provides outreach and awareness. Uh, we're creating awareness to provide education to our VA, to our Veterans Health Administration staff again, and again to community partners regarding caregiving uh, support and services. Because the caregiver support program itself uh, does provide a lot of support and services. And then we're at uh, our pillar of trusted partnerships. Uh, that looks again at advocacy and transparency. Um, our program recognizes and promotes the importance of the caregiver role and the unique needs of our caregivers. Uh, they have unique needs both within Veterans Health Administration and in the community. So we want to increase their visibility, um, their involvement, and we want to support that. Um, VHA and the Caregiver Support Program uh, looks at transparency and we want to demonstrate strong ethics and accountability towards that uh, through our policy of the development of that policy and our program administration. Service excellence, our last pillar um, encompasses everything from research, that policy development again, and then stewardship. Um, so with the research, we're looking at um, innovative best practices and the best, best practices come out in the services that we provide to our caregivers, um, policy development. So we have to make sure that our policy is aligned with the regulations. And the regulations that are of our program is they come down to Congress. So we have to align those, our policies with those regulations. Um, we also want to align our policies with some of those best practices. So our support groups, and services that we offer, we want to align again with our, that research. And then stewardship. Um, we have to be responsible um, stewards you know, to the resources that we have within VA. Um, here's a big overview of the caregiver support program. So I kind of went through our pillars and everything, but here is what the caregiver support program really encompasses. Um, and it really encompasses two programs, um, both the program of general caregiver support services and the program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers. Um, people may have heard a lot about the program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers because that program expanded as of October 1, 2020. Uh, so that program was perhaps in the news much more. You may have heard about that much more uh, because of that program expansion and because that program also comes with a month of cycle. However, the program of general caregiver support services, that program really encompasses support and services for all of the caregivers that we have under Veterans Health Administration. Um, so there's all sorts of services that we provide to all of our caregivers, whether someone's in what we call our PGCSS program and also PCOFC program. So again, we provide that training and education, um, our caregiver support line for them, um, support groups uh, and programs that are di diagnosis specific, be that maybe PTSD or dementia specific um, support groups such as those. Um, we have our caregiver support website that can provide information on things like that as well. Uh, we have peer support mentoring that our program staff uh, can refer our participants to. Um, we have resources for enhancing all caregivers' health, which is called REACH, which can be individual counseling or also group counseling. And our staff are certified in that. Uh, we also offer self care courses. Um, so all of that's included in what we call our PGCSS program or general caregiver support services. We look at that smaller circle of PCFC or program comprehensive assistance um, that comes with that monthly stipend, access to CHAMP VA if someone's eligible, mental health counseling, um, 
again, more caregiver training, the required caregiver training course, um, enhanced respite services. Um, many of our veterans in the community can qualify for respite services. Um, certain beneficiary travel uh, benefits, and then ongoing um, wellness visits um, as required by the program and participation. Um, these can be like in the home wellness visits. Jennifer, I, yeah. I hate to interrupt you, but a couple of our listeners are saying you're a little fuzzy. Maybe moving your mic might help a little bit with your audio. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Oh. And if we look at our uh, the program of general caregiver support services, I'm moving along there. So again, the PGCSS program, um, the program of general caregiver support services serves caregivers of enrolled veterans of all eras. Um, so there's no exclusion there. We define a general caregiver as a person who provides personal care services to a veteran who needs assistance with one or more activities of daily living, or they could need uh, supervision or protection based on symptoms or residuals of neurological care or other impairment or injury. And so that could be uh, something like a mental health need could be causing that, um, TBI, dementia, that could be the cause for the need for supervision or protection when we look at that. Supports and services that we have available for all of our caregivers. Again, we're looking at resource and referral, education, training, support, and counseling. When we look at counseling specifically under our PGCSS program, um, that does have to be in connection with the treatment of the veteran's disability. So we could be looking at providing um, counseling services for something like um, caregiver burnout. Um, you know, so we are able to provide some kind of some like time limited counseling services um, to our caregivers um, under this program. Um, but again, our education training uh, services, our self-care courses, our peer mentoring, our support groups, um, all available to caregivers through the PGCSS program. Um, again, these veterans, um, they do have to be enrolled in DHA to be able to use these services from us. Here are just some supports uh, that may be eligible to veterans. Um, veterans don't have to be enrolled in our caregiver support program, um, but this is just included as, again, these are services for someone who uh, may be enrolled. If they have to be enrolled in VHA, um, but just some good services for some of our veterans. Um, some in-home care, such as skilled nursing, home health aid, uh, home-based primary care, so a primary care team that may come out to the veteran's home if they need that. Um, and then some other uh, community-based care services for our veterans, um, respite care, um, either in a community facility or in the home, um, adult daycare services as well. Um, and then uh, mobility aids, um, we have home modification grants, uh, prosthetics and continence supplies, um, so all sorts of services really through um, available in regards to equipment and supplies and accessing these types of services are really available to our veterans through their primary care team. And the VA certainly allows our veterans to, if someone is really connected to, uh, let's say a community PCP primary care provider, uh, and maybe they live far away from the VA, we certainly uh, work with veterans who maybe want to see both. But there's a lot of benefits um, available in regards to home health aids, respite, equipment, and supplies um, if they want to utilize those and still maybe see their community provider. If we're looking at, um, if we move on and look at our uh, program of competence and assistance for family caregivers, 
Uh, so this program changed as of October 1, uh, 2002. Um, so this offers enhanced clinical support for caregivers of eligible veterans who were seriously injured in the line of duty on or after September 11th, 2001, or before May 7th, 1975. So that's covering uh, Vietnam era veterans. Uh, after October 1, 2022, we're gonna be able to cover all veterans. Um, so that is when that uh, will we'll start to cover everybody. Um, but right now we still have a gap uh, but we're kind of in phase one of that enhanced uh, rollout. So additional benefits that are available for our PCAFC enrollees are a financial stipend, access to CHAMP VA healthcare insurance if a caregiver is otherwise uninsured, they can get CHAMP VA. Um, additional now health counseling, caregiver training, uh, respite care, enhanced respite care, more than what would otherwise be eligible, a program called Hero Miles, uh, additional travel and per diem compensation uh, if they're traveling for a veteran's VA medical appointments. Um, and then again, they need to participate in what we would call ongoing wellness visits. And these would be in the home wellness visits uh, that would be required as part of the program. Some background in regards to our expansion. This PCFC program was originally only open to eligible post 9-11 veterans. This remains a clinical program. So the program uh, that Kelly originally was speaking about in regards to aid and attendance, uh, that program is managed by Veterans Benefits. Uh, this program is administered by Veterans Health Administration. Uh, so this is a clinical program that people need to meet clinical guidelines uh, for. So the final rule that was published allows VA to standardize uh, our PCFC program and to focus on eligible veterans with moderate and severe needs. And that moderate and severe needs, again, we're focusing on activities of daily living and they kind of oper operationalize that whole definition. Um, and we, so this allows us to kind of enhance our experience of PCAFC participants when we're looking at that. It really has been a significant change for our participants uh, who have been in the program. This previously was open only to post 9-11 uh, veterans, and now it's open to both post 9-11 post and Vietnam era uh, service time veterans. Uh, this, this rule, uh, it says a veteran or qualifying service member uh, must have a service-connected disability rating uh, by VA of at least 70%. It can be a single disability rating or a combined rating to qualify for the program. Um, and that's what we mean by a serious injury. The veteran must also be in need of personal care services. But a serious injury is also defined as a serious injury or a serious illness. So something like uh, diabetes, which is an illness, meets that, that qualification. The service connection needs to be connected to either their post-9-11 or Vietnam era service time. So we do have some veterans that maybe part of their service time is in Vietnam and then goes after that their, some of their service connection has to be from when they were in Vietnam, or we have veterans that part of their service time was before that post 9-11 and then after it, we're looking at their service connection, some of it's connected to that service time from post 9-11. So that's kind of, but that's what that, that last line is, is talking about. And come a year or so from now, come just about a year from now, uh, we really won't be looking at that anymore. What does that all really mean? Um, again, we're looking at ADLs, just like some of the agent attendance stuff was looking at ADLs. VA defines an inability to perform an activity of daily living 
um, as the veteran or service member requiring personal care services each time he or she completes one or more of the qualifying ADLs. Um, needing help with an ADL only some of the time it's completed would not constitute an inability to perform it. So it really is that they need help with it each time. And when we do assessments, it could be you know, that they need full assistance with it or they could need you know, moderate assistance with it. So we do, there's a range of how much assistance they could need with that activity of daily living. VA defines a need for supervision, protection, or instruction as the individual having a functional impairment that directly impacts his or her ability. I didn't share that with you. Um, his or her ability to maintain his or her personal safety on a daily basis. Um, so again, we're really looking at, uh, we are really looking at a moderate to a severe need when we're looking at this program that's providing compensation for caregivers. Our PCAFC program has two levels of care. Uh, it used to have uh, three tiers in regards to compensation. In order for a veteran to qualify uh, for this program, the individual is either a veteran or they could be a member of the armed forces who's undergoing medical discharge and we would have a discharge date. Uh, the individual has their serious injury incurred or ag aggravated on or after September 11th um, or on or before May 7th, 1975 or um, after October 1, um, 2022 will be that, that next date. Uh, do these next ones. Uh, then these next requirements is uh, the individual is in need of personal care services for a minimum of six continuous months. So we really are looking at um, that time frame that they do need at least six continuous months of needing that personal care services. And it's based on any one of the following, um, either that inability to perform the activity of daily living or need for supervision, protection, or instruction. Um, and then it is in the best interest of the individual to participate in the program. And then uh, personal care services that would be provided by the family caregiver will not be simultaneously and regularly provided by or through another individual or entity. So uh, another agency would not be coming in and doing these services uh, for, the, for the veteran. The caregiver has to be uh, the person who is providing the services for them. The individual receives care at home and will do so if he designates a family caregiver. And then uh, the individual is receiving ongoing care from a VA care team uh, or will do so if VA designates a family caregiver. So that really is looking at the veteran is enrolled in VA care uh, and that the VA is receiving VA primary care. And that can either be you know, through coming to a VA clinic or if they're choosing to get VA care through um, like care in the community, but they do have to be getting uh, VA care through care in the, you know, through through VA somehow in order to be uh, doing that. Um, I missed a slide that I wanted to provide here, um, but the requirements for a family caregiver uh, is that the family caregiver uh, has to be at least 18 years of age. Uh, they need to be uh, the eligible veterans spouse, son, daughter, parent, step family member, or an extended family member. So we do give uh, a rather wide birth in regards to who a family member can be, um, or someone who lives with the eligible veteran full time, or will do so if designated as a family caregiver. 
So we have had people apply to the program who maybe don't live with the veteran right now, but agree that they will uh, if approved. So, and then a caregiver also um, has to be assessed as being able to complete caregiver education and training. And then they have, they have to actually, they do have to complete the caregiver training and demonstrate the ability to care, to carry out the specific personal care services and the competencies uh, required. And then um, VA has to also have no uh, findings of any neglect or abuse by the caregiver. Uh, those are the requirements for a family caregiver. Uh, in regards to stipend levels, there are two stipend levels, uh, and those are determined a level one and a level two. A level two is the highest stipend level, and these are, it can vary by locality. Uh, what the payment rate is, what the government says is a GS4 step one. Um, for the highest payment rate, we pay 100% of that. Uh, we pay a lower, like 62% of that. Uh, we're, we're looking at like per year, like 20,000 to 32,000 a year. So this is not a whole lot of money, but, but that's what it, it comes out to. And again, that can vary by locality. Um, this is the application process. And it does take 90 days. Uh, sometimes it can take a little bit less. Sometimes it can take uh, a little bit more. So that's the approximate 90 days. Uh, a, a veteran and a caregiver need to submit an application. They can submit either a paper application, which our office can mail people an application, or you can submit it online. It can be submitted completely online, but both the veteran and the caregiver need to submit that application online because uh, they are providing a digital signature that they're submitting the application. Um, we receive that application and one of our caregiver support coordinators uh, contact both the veteran and caregiver and do an intake. Uh, next steps are the veteran assessment, the caregiver assessment, a functional assessment of essentially some of those activities of daily living that we talked about. Our team then also collaborates with that primary care provider on their medical condition. Um, on uh, if the caregiver has been coming to appointments, things like that. Uh, and all of that goes into the medical record. Previously, some of the uh, eligibility had been determined at, at the local level. That no longer happens. It is all done uh, at a higher level um, by eligibility teams that are specially trained in this. And they are, you know, physician assistants, psychologists, occupational therapists, and social workers, and they all review the initial application. And if they say it's a go, then it comes back to our team to continue on with the application process. If they deny it and say that it doesn't meet, uh, you know, application status, then we have that conversation and let the veteran and, and forgiver know that you can't continue on with the application process. If it's a go, then the caregiver needs to do the training. And then our team needs to do a home care assessment and where they actually go into a home and assess the home and assess again, those ADLs and skills that the caregiver is assisting with. It goes back to that eligibility team for a final review. And again, we look at if the application is approved or denied, um, we speak to the veteran and the caregiver in regards to the notice of decision. Um, along the way, you know, if we get an application that doesn't meet uh, regulatory standards, but for the veteran didn't serve during any periods of service, or if they're only 50% service connected, we would have that con conversation in the beginning of the process where we would have to deny that application. Um, However, all along the way, we would offer a veteran and caregiver services through our program of general caregiver support services and look at what supports and services we can provide to them through that program. If an application is denied and 
they're still interested in, in a veteran and caregiver disagree, uh, they have rights to appeal. And our team certainly goes over those rights to appeal and how to how to work that process. And they can appeal those decisions. So they can do that. Uh, I did want to, I will give you our team first. Um, this is everyone in our, our team right now. Um, this is our main office number in Iowa City. Uh, so people can always contact that number. And uh, our program support person, Stacy, is the main person who answers that number. But if she's not available, you can always leave a message. Uh, one of our social workers can always speak with you. Or even if you want a packet of information, we can mail that information out to you. We can mail you a paper application if you're in interested in applying to the PCFC program. Um, another way just to get information on the PCAFC program is to go to caregiver.va.gov. There's tons of useful information on the caregiver support website. And maybe a third of the way down on that website is uh, a link that says, I believe it's like apply here. Uh, you can click that link and apply online there. Um, if you are a guardian, um, to a veteran and um, you want to apply to the program, you can apply without the veteran and there's links for you to be able to upload guardianship paperwork while doing the application because we would need that paperwork for you to apply on your own without that, that veteran giving consent, but you can upload that paperwork right there through the website. But we were Jennifer, could you repeat the VA phone number, please? Yes. Thank it, you. It is 319-688-6933. That is our main number in Iowa City. Thank you. Do you know the one for in the Cedar Rapids area by chance? The Cedar Rapids area, just like the outpatient clinic? Oh, okay. Forget. I'll. I didn't know if that would help him with anything. This is just for the. This is this is our caregiver support. Um, okay. For our staff. Um, okay, the, that's fine. Yeah, the Cedar Rapids area has both the Cedar Rapids Outpatient Clinic, and then there's the Lynn County Veterans Affairs Office. Okay. In Cedar Rapids. So. Okay. That would Perfect. be different. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um. So, uh, which brings me to, and I was gonna lead off with this, but I didn't, um, as I, and I alluded to, there's three different branches of the VA, which uh, people get confused about a little bit. There's um, Veterans Health Administration, uh, which I work for and James works for. And so all of uh, caregiver support and the medical center in Iowa City is under, the outpatient clinic in Cedar Rapids, we're all under Veterans Health Administration. And so this clinical program is under Veterans Health Administration. Um, Veterans Benefits, which is another branch of VHA, um, deals with a lot of other, other benefits that deal with money, uh, such as um, aid and attendance pension that came under our first presentation that we had. Uh, other benefits such as VA home loans, uh, uh, GI Bill benefits, uh, things such as that, service-connected disability, which plays into how, how you can qualify for this program, service-connected disability, that's all under uh, VBA and them. Uh, and then our other branch is uh, the National Cemeteries. So they're their own branch of a VA. Um, and then uh, I believe it was Nicole who was supposed to be on today, but wasn't. She's a veteran service officer. She actually doesn't work for any of those three branches for the federal government. Um, you know, she reports to the, the Lynn County um, Veterans Board of Directors. Um, and again, there's, there's veteran uh, service officers basically in every county um, that helps veterans apply for um, benefits with, the, with, 
you know, with national uh, VA, you know, across across the nation. Um, they're very useful, you know, with people looking at things such as aid and attendance and pension and service connected disability. Um, our staff and social workers at the medical center routinely refer people to um, county service officers um, all over the state. Our presentation for uh, caregiver support is, is done. Uh, you any other questions or anything that myself or, or James can do for you? Thank you so much, Jennifer. And we did have a couple questions. Um, the first one I see is, how do I find the application for VA care, caregiver support? And is there help offered for the application process or is it easy to submit? Um, I see that uh, Harrison put our website uh, in the chat box. Um, so again, you can go on to that website and you can about a third of the way down there there's like apply online you can click on there and apply through there it is it's pretty easy um you're looking at like name social security numbers and, and things like that um there is someone more than one person can apply as a caregiver um so you would generally identify a primary caregiver and a primary caregiver would be someone who would be eligible for that stipend. If you want to have a secondary caregiver, um, secondary caregivers can apply as well. They would need to do that training and have to participate in you know, the home assessments and home visits as well too, but they would need to be identified uh, on that application as well. Uh, so they would have to do the application too. Uh, secondary caregivers can be added in, in the, the future as well if they want to. Um, but the application is pretty easy. If people have questions about the application, uh, they can always give our office a call, which uh, if our number is not in the chat, it is 319-688-6936. Uh, we can always call that number. Our uh, program staff, uh, we're kind of located, we're not, most of the time we're not in the medical center, we're located in an offsite building, but we do have program staff out here in the medical center um, Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, James, help me out. It's Wednesday after, it's Wednesday afternoon um, from 12.30 to four and it is Friday morning. Um, from 8.30 to 1. Uh, right. one huh? I was saying correct. So we have office hours in the event that there are people who are in the Iowa City area so they can get support. Um, that was all I was saying, just saying yes. Yep. So we do have staff up here um, who would need help. So if someone wants to, if they're looking at, at the application and they do have questions, they could certainly call the number that I just put in the chat box. Um, and ask to meet with one of the caregiver support social workers uh, and arrange a time when we do have our office hours out here in the medical center is an option. Or uh, we could also set up like a, a telehealth appointment if they wanted to speak with someone face-to-face -face, or we could walk them through it on the telephone. Um, it's pretty easy. I've met sometimes with some uh, veterans caregivers who have maybe dropped off an application at our patient advocate's office and have had one or two questions and you can you know, check that box sign here and you're good to go. Well, thanks for that, Jennifer. Uh, we have a couple more questions here. Uh, another one, what support or programs are available for veterans experiencing homelessness? Uh, we have lots of support and programs for uh, veterans experiencing homelessness. And, and I recently uh, stole James from the homeless program. Uh, so we, we both know a little bit about that. Uh, and the VA has a, a homeless hotline, uh, which is a good place to start depending on uh, what's, go what's going on with the veteran. 
And VA has recently expanded services and it has even a, an expanded definition of what a veteran is. Uh, different, different government entities have a different definition of what a veteran is. Uh, so in regards to homelessness, the VA has a, 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 an expanded definition in regards to who will serve. So we have grant for DM programs uh, and we'll serve veterans in our GPD programs uh, where we'll get beds in our homeless shelters and provide case management to veterans. Uh, we have HUD dash vouchers for our veterans. Uh, we'll, we'll provide case management uh, to veterans and work with getting apartments for them um, through essentially section eight vouchers uh, with them. Uh, yep, thank you. Uh, so uh, we just have a wide variety. Uh, if anyone has questions, um, I don't know, James, if you can provide the phone number to uh, the Cedar Rapids CRRC in the chat box um, is also a good number. If anyone has knows of a veteran who is homeless, uh, we have a community resource and referral center in Cedar Rapids, and we have a community resource and referral center in Davenport. Um, and so both of those resource and referral centers uh, provide everything from a food bank to um, clothing closets uh, to, you know, kind of drop-in centers. And there's um, outreach social workers in both of those facilities uh, that can meet with homeless veterans to kind of get them on track to looking at, do we need to get you into a shelter tonight? Um, what shelters are available? And then working through what's the next step? Is it, you know, shelter for a while? Is it a GPD program? Is it a dash? You know, what other resources do you need? What income do you have? What income do we need to start signing you up for? Do we need to just find IDs for you? Do you even have an ID? Um, but kind of starting, um, starting with one of our CRRCs, um, we can go into it with, with all sorts of services. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, and it look, you did explain, I think, in the chat box, but a couple of our listeners might not have access to that and had questions about the Hero Miles program. The Hero Miles program um, is a program where um, people can donate their airline miles to caregivers and veterans. Um, so if they're in need of some type of treatment where they maybe need to like fly across the country or you know fly somewhere else for that treatment. Um, so if I have like airline miles from you know whatever airline company, I can donate my miles to Hero Miles. And then that allows uh, someone like then my caregiver support coordinator, Holly, would say that I'm eligible to use Hero Miles and would, you know, sign me up for that to be able to go to, I don't know, the Los Angeles VA to get this treatment. So my caregiver support coordinator would have to then refer me to Hero Miles so that we, we could then drop me at that bank of Hero Miles to, to go use that. Did I miss any questions here? I'm trying to cover the chat box and everything else. It looks like we're, looks like you've done a great job, James and, and Jennifer, answering our questions today. Thank you so much. I think we've got them all, don't we, Karen? Yeah, I think so. Well, again, I'd like to thank our presenters, Nicole and Jennifer, and also thank James and Kelly for joining us. You can see with caregivers, it really is a village and we all take care of each other and step in with when needed. And we've shown that today. Uh, so thanks everyone. Um, our presenters have provided their information, their contact information. If anyone has questions later on, you know, you can certainly send it to, to Heritage. You can put it on our Facebook. You can give us a call. We will get you in touch with the right person to answer all those questions. We don't want them to go unanswered. Uh, it just continues on. We will see everyone next month. Uh, until then, big thanks to everyone again. Thanks to Karen for co-hosting today. Sure. And thanks, thanks also. 
Yeah, Barb, the, I was just going to say, I want to make sure we gave them the date for next month. It's October oh, yes, 12th, yes. Yes. October 12th. And our speakers will be uh, Phyllis Zelensky from the Iowa State University Extension Office and Pam Railsbeck with the long, she's the long-term care abundsman. So two great speakers for next month's meeting. So hopefully you'll be able to join us. Two great speakers, yes. Well, thanks Karen from Home Instead. Thanks also to The View Senior Living for sponsoring us today. The webinar, this one and the other ones we've had in the past months are all on the Heritage website, heritageaaa.org. Anyone have anyone else to, anything else to add before we close for the day? Thanks all, nice to see you and we'll see you again next month. Have a great month. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.